네, 안녕하십니까? Hello everyone. I am Im Jae-min and I am from the Energy Transition Forum Korea. 그럼 지금부터 2022년 평창 평화 Without further ado, we will begin the 12th partner session of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum on the theme of the climate crisis and the task of energy conversion on the Korean Peninsula. This session will cover topics that uh, are connected closely to the sustainability uh, on the Korean Peninsula. We have three presenters, and then we will have two panelists who represent uh, the young advocates for environmental preservation. The first presenter will uh, talk about the re response on North, in Northeast Asia on climate change and the ways of achieving sustainable development on the Korean Peninsula. And the speaker is Mr. Nam Sang-mi, Nam Sang-min, Deputy Head of East and Northeast Asia Office of UNESCO. And then we will have Dr. Hwang Jin-tae, who's a research fellow from Korea Institute for National Unification, who will talk about the Korean Peninsula energy transition and uh, the idea for a low-carbon peace community. And then we will have Ms. Kim chun Yi, Executive Director of the Korea Federation of Environmental Movements, who will talk about the ecological and peace cooperation on the Korean Peninsula. And then we will enter into a panel discussion involving Dr. Park Jin Hee, Mr. Nam Sang Min, uh, Mr. Hwang Jin Tae, and Kim Chun Yi, Kang Eun Bin, and Yi Eun Ho. Uh, and uh, we will talk about ways in which we can address the uh, climate issue and sustainability issue on the Korean Peninsula. So without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Professor Park Jin Hee to uh, moderate. Hello, welcome to our session. We are going to talk about the climate crisis and the task of energy conversion on the Korean Peninsula. Again, we have three presenters, and then we will enter into a panel discussion. I am the moderator. I am Park Jin Hee. As you know, the Korean Peninsula is, of course, not an exception to the climate crisis. It's a very urgent situation that we have uh, on this pen uh, peninsula. And climate crisis responses can also be linked to peace building processes and also other ways of partnership between the two Koreas. We have three presenters who will enlighten us with ideas that can contribute to that sort of partnership. And we will also have representatives of the young generation who are active in the field of environmental conservation. So please stay with us till the end of the session and take part in the panel discussion that will follow after the presentation. Um, our first speaker is Mr. Nam Sang-min, Deputy Head of East and Northeast Asia Office of UNESCO. Uh, each presenter will be given 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Nam is connected online. Please, Mr. Nam. Yes, uh, I will begin. Hello, everyone. I am Nam Sang Min, uh, working at UNESCAP. Can you see my slide? Yes, very well. I am sorry that I could not be with you. The title is Measures for Sustainable Development on the Korean Peninsula Responding to the Climate Crisis in Northeast Asia, but I'm going to focus on 
energy and measures of cooperation vis-à-vis uh, -vis the energy crisis. The East and Northeast Asia Office of UNESCAP covers the six countries, including China, Japan, Korea, Mongol, and it was formed several years ago. We have Korea uh, and Russia, North Korea, and, but I am going to focus on uh, Korea, China, and Japan. Looking at the greenhouse gas emissions in Northeast Asia, we see uh, the graph in 2030, and to meet the carbon neutrality goal, the role of the Northeast Asian countries is very important. Right now, Northeast Asia emits 33% of the world emissions and 40% of the global CO2, but fortunately, Korea has been curbing the greenhouse gas emissions, but compared to 2018, in 2020, there was a 10% reduction. But is this a downward trend or is it just temporary? We have to wait and see. As for Japan, after the Fukushima incident, there was a slight increase in the emissions, but went down in, starting in 2013. And as for China, their target is to reach a net zero by 2030. And the common challenges faced by these countries is that they are relying heavily on fossil fuels in the power sector as high as 60%. And when we look at China, during the last 10 years, the renewables have taken a larger portion. It includes hydropower. The renewables account for 30% of the energy mix, and Japan exceeds 20%. But in Korea, it's only 6%. In 2021, uh, in China, renewables capacity exceeded 1,000 including uh, solar, hydro, and uh, wind. So China has lowered the renewables uh, cost and has increased the share of renewables in its energy mix. After the Fukushima incident in Japan, the uh, renewable sector grew in Japan it's 70 gigawatts, but in Korea, the capacity for renewables is about 25. Uh, the change globally is significant, but we have to watch out for China. And looking at the installed capacity, it's 40 percent, and uh, generated capacity, it's about 28 percent. And uh, we should watch closely how fast this ex accelerates. And we now need to look at North Korea and Mongol. They are severely damaged due to climate change. And this graph shows uh, the crop yield included in the DPRK VNR report 2021. In 2020, there was a huge typhoon, and I looked at the VNR report, and the word disaster is mentioned 70 times, and climate change is mentioned 25 times. And the usage of the climate change word is more frequent than farming. So because of climate change, the Consequences are hard hit, and North Korea has set the agenda to resolve these issues. In Mongol, uh, compared to the 1993 
the temperature has changed. And every four to five years, uh, livestock freeze to death. And this uh, has an effect on the livestock uh, farming households and they migrate to the cities and they become the city or the urban poor and uh, leading to air pollution uh, whether extreme conditions uh, loss of livestock urban poor uh, urban poverty and air pollution, they form a vicious circle. And this shows uh, the chain of reactions. And looking at carbon neutrality in Northeast Asia, not just Northeast Asia, but uh, the Southeast Asian countries and the South Asian countries, except for Pakistan, have announced their carbon neutrality goals. The three countries in Northeast Asia upgraded their NDC 2030 targets, and this is an effect of additionally reducing 1.2 GTCO2 per annum. And so we have to reduce carbon much faster and much more than the other countries. And one approach is the renewables based uh, interconnectedness in Northeast Asia. Korea, Japan, China, and many institutions have proposed this measure. There are several uh, proposals, but they are in a similar context. On the far right in the corner, including KEPCO, many institutions have done uh, feasibility tests for economic and technological performances, and 330 kilometers of the coast is connected already. The feasibility test uh, shows that it is feasible technologically and economically. And last year, ADB completed this study. It's a 100 giga project interconnecting the various countries in the region. And in order to put these plans to action, there are relevant institutions. In Korea, there's KEPCO, and then there's a counterpart in China, and they formed the Northeast Asia Regional Power Interconnection and Cooperation Forum, and UNSCAP is overseeing the dialogue. And we do benchmark the situation in Europe. 35 countries are uh, sharing the grid. Individual countries, uh, more than 10% of the power consumption and supply are connected and they're exported. And in North Sea, Norway and England is connected. This was completed last year. This is an under Seas cable extending 720 kilometers. So uh, we have a lot uh, to benchmark uh, from Europe, and we are increasing the share of renewables in Northeast Asia. There's the issue of curtailment. But in order to minimize curtailment, it is important to interconnect the power grid. 170 terawatt hour was proposed, and Korea's total production capacity uh, out of that 30% was curtailed. And to minimize curtailment, we need a regional interconnection. So in that sense, we need the participation of North Korea. This is written in the report that they published, that World Bank published. Electricity access is 34.6% and other countries 
have low access Papua New Guinea, but their access is in the 70% range. And compared to these countries who have low electricity supply, North Korea is even half of that with their very low 34.6%. And another area of cooperation is uh, renewables. And in 2016, uh, North Korea NDC is talking about uh, the amount of renewables energy that they want to expand, and they're talking about the relevant cost. So they're making internal investment, and they're refurbishing the relevant systems. And so improving the energy efficiency is a very important task. And we need North Korea to participate in the Northeast Asia Energy Interconnected Forum. Uh, North Korea is working with China in co-generating uh, power. There are uh, hydropower plants alongside the China North, e North Korea border. So uh, it's a 50 50 power sharing. The six water dams produce about 1.8 giga. So it does, if it has the will to participate in the Northeast Asia Energy Interconnected Forum, then I think it is feasible. And this uh, graph is showing the GEI DCO proposal of how the Northeast Asian countries can cooperate. With this, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you talked about the possibility of energy conversion through renewables and interconnection. And in relation to that, you talked about potential energy cooperation on the Korean Peninsula. And you shared your experience with us. And next, our second presentation is also concerning the issue of energy, but it's a broader topic uh, because the topic is energy transition in Korean Peninsula, low carbon peace community. Uh, so on that, Mr. Hwang Jin Tae will deliver his presentation. Hello, I am Hwang Jin Tae. Uh, I belong to, I'm a research fellow at the Korea Institute for National Unification. This is the title of my presentation, Energy Transition in Korean Peninsula, um, Plan for Low Carbon Peace Community. Actually, I did not choose this particular title. Uh, the organizers have asked me to cover this topic, uh, and I actually am very much interested in this proposed topic, so I was able to enjoy uh, this process of preparing for this presentation. We are here in Pyeongchang. It's a very nice place in terms of the quality of air and its nice natural surroundings. But um, it is also the venue of 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. And as you can see in the picture here, you know, during that Winter Olympics, there was this uh, expectations of thawing of relationships, as you can see in this picture, where the two leaders were uh, quite friendly. But um, I hope that this kind of uh, prospects can return to us uh, so that we can look forward to better relations on this peninsula. And uh, the scholars and researchers who were studying the energy transition here in South Korea uh, decided to look into the energy transition topic across the Korean Peninsula as they saw the following of relationship uh, years back. So this particular book, which says Energy Transition on Korean Peninsula, uh, this book was published. And today, I am very happy to be 
able to introduce to you this very book uh, because it covers a very important topic. And we also have the uh, younger generation of people who are interested in this very topic. So uh, this is an important publication that you can look into. Now, I don't have enough time to actually go into the details of the uh, potential creation of an energy transition uh, based on peaceful uh, community building. Uh, so I would like to first touch upon just the three obstacles that undermine creative approaches to energy transition on the peninsula. Uh, so now here is here are three concepts. Uh, first is the state-oriented approach, and the second uh, is the eco economy-oriented approach, and third is South Korea-oriented approach. So these are the three obstacles that undermine creative approaches to energy transition on the peninsula. So this is the nationalism or the state-oriented approach. Now, basically, if we are based on nationalism, we are focused on either South Korea or North Korea. And as I have written here, when we were looking at the Korean society, we always had in mind the idea of nationalism and ideologies. And we looked at the particular uh, country of Korea uh, as a space within the territory. And we just focus particularly on the country rather than looking at this from various levels, uh, for example, uh, from the regional level or from the global level or going down to the city level. So as you can see in the billiards, uh, there are these set of uh, billiard balls here that are all marked in different colors, but there is a stratified way in which these balls are always, um, you know, situated. And I think this is the kind of way in which we looked at uh, this problem. And we used to see the Korean Peninsula as having North Korea uh, marked in red and South Korea marked in blue. And uh, we also saw North Korea uh, as being closer to Russia and China, while South Korea is closer to United States and Japan. And I think we need to move away and move, move above this kind of a perspective. And now this picture perhaps can invite us to do that. This is a picture taken by NASA. And I love this photo because it's a great inspiration. Uh, NASA, regarding this picture, said that Pyongyang is a small island. Uh, and it talked about the per capita power consumption gap between the two Koreas uh, because you can't see in this picture the coastline of North Korea because of the lack of power. And so we often see the lights as indicators of the locations of cities. And you can see in North Korea, uh, there is almost a black hole. And you can uh, look at this from a planetary perspective and see this as an evidence of planetary urbanization. And North Korea can be situated within that context of planetary urbanization. And because of the economic sanctions, uh, you know, the exporting of resources is not as active as before, but North Korea used to export a lot of coal to China. And in fact, the lights that are located in the Shandong province of China uh, were possible because a lot of coal was exported to China. 
So while you can see this black hole in North Korea, we could situate it in the context of the planetary urbanization. And we need to see from a transboundary perspective uh, the situation of North Korea as we uh, seek to create uh, better approaches to energy transition on the peninsula. And uh, secondly, the economy-oriented approach. We often place economy above other values like justice or the environment. So I just uh, wanted to summarize that in the term economy-oriented approach. So from this approach, we often see North Korea as a rich reserve of natural resources. Even the more progressive papers like Hangyore uh, described North Korea as a, um, a place of rich natural resources, uh, and they described North Korea as having Samsung and Hyundai underground. So that's the way in which we saw North Korea. And also there was a plan for building a peace power plant that was part of the plan uh, created by the South Korean government to build such uh, power plant along the border area. And this is, you know, fossil fuel based. And if we look at uh, the North Korea's position on coal, actually there was a major working uh, workers' party congress, and there it mentions that there should be further acceleration of uh, explore, exploration and speeding up of digging to expand the coal mines and use advanced mining you know, methodology. So basically, North Korea is looking to further the use of fossil fuels. So we have to think whether this peace power plant plan should be based on such fossil fuels. We should think about whether it is right to pursue it in that way. And I think uh, we need to be able to think about that by overcoming the economy-oriented approach. UN SCOP uh, published a report on the supergrid plan, as was mentioned by Mr. Nam just before, and SoftBank is a sponsor of that plan. Uh, Founder of SoftBank, Mr. Sun, actually proposed this Asia Supergrid plan, and the Moon Jae-in administration uh, also participated in a meeting with Mr. Sun uh, to talk about the idea of Supergrid plan. The Asia Supergrid uh, uh, just before was mentioned that there is economic uh, viability and feasibility, but again, there is a lack of understanding of the differences in the capitalist and socialist systems, uh, and there is this preoccupation with economic growth, and there is this lack of consideration of alternative transition pathways, and there's this focus on just expanding uh, the infrastructure. And so these are some of the limitations of the Asia Supergrid plan as was proposed um, and discussed in Korea. So we often think that we are the only ones that can you know, design the plans for further development and that we should take the initiative. But I think that South Korea-oriented approach is very limiting. So I would like to throw out to you a couple of ideas for you to think about. And then I would like to hear a feedback from our panelists. So I have some concrete and also actionable imaginative visions. And my first idea is to maybe just leave the coal underground in North Korea. So maybe I will just touch upon the third bullet point here. So often we look at this picture and think that North Korea is just underdeveloped. And to have more light on uh, the North Korean territory is the better uh, improvement. And that would mean you know, expansion of peace and uh, positive development. But 
You know, there is the issue of Anthropocene and uh, low carbon goals that we need to think of. And instead of trying to develop the fossil fuels in North Korea to boost economic growth, I think we should uh, think about the environmental impact of maybe keeping the coal underground in North Korea. And that could actually gain greater legitimacy uh, for the idea of creating a peace community on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so we see these activities in other countries to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, so I think we could potentially uh, try to manage the fossil fuel reserves of North Korea as a commons. Now, my second idea is uh, perhaps to encourage and support the decentralized energy transition in North Korea. Of course, North Korea uh, talk about the energy transition in the broad sense, but it is not really taking place across North Korea and because of sanctions and also underdevelopment, uh, it was very difficult for North Korea to establish the necessary infrastructure. Whereas in Korea, there is KEPCO that uh, is able to build a centralized infrastructure. Uh, this in turn means that decentralization of the energy transition is actually more possible in North Korea because there is no centralized infrastructure in place. Uh, so we need to think of this potential. If you look at some of the documentation in North Korea, there is the Renewable Energies Act that was instituted in 2013, and also uh, newspapers like the Labor uh, newspaper uh, talk about the need to uh, create an integrated power management framework. And since the 1990s, after the arduous march, according to Dr. Kang's research, individuals have been individuals have been using energy in various ways to make up for the lack of energy provision by the government. And so South Korean government should think about how to help the decentralized energy transition in North Korea, uh, taking into account the actual situation in North Korea. So we need to understand the real situation on the ground. So you can see the picture in on right. Uh, they're actually carrying, you know, uh, barrels of propane gas. So we need to take into account these real situations and become real partners and supporters uh, for a meaningful energy transition in North Korea. And in order to discuss uh, energy transition on the Korean Peninsula, we need to move beyond the siloed approach of looking at individual energy sectors, but to have more multi-level uh, view of the overall energy system and have transformative thinking uh, to come up with new ideas. And we really need to see beyond the closed territories of the two Koreas, and we need spatial imagination to envision a new society on the peninsula while taking into consideration its connection and place in the broader Northeast Asian region. And also, we need to go beyond the assumptions of expected future based on past history toward a vision of the desirable future. We need to think about the ecological um, outcomes, and we need to think about the broader environment and so that we can actually work towards a desirable future rather than an expected future. So there is the solar panel in the back in the picture. Uh, we you know, need to be inspired by these ideas for a better energy transition on the peninsula. Thank you very much for delivering very important messages in the short 
period of time that was just 15 minutes, uh, he talked about the imaginative visions for energy transition. He has uh, provided some food for thought that helped us think out of the box. And the third speaker is Executive Director Kim Chun Yi of KFEM. She's going to talk about the preservation of the environment around the DMZ area. I am going to present a different topic from the earlier presenters, but I am going to talk about the preservation of the ecosystem. And I'm going to focus on the area near the civilian control line. Uh, you're familiar with the map of Korea. We are a divided nation, and <coughs> there is the, bound, the border line. The, we have this four kilometer area of uh, TMZ, and from Gyeonggi province to Gangwon province, we have this control line against citizen or the CCL. Uh, uh, or the CCZ civilian control zone. Why is the region important? I'd like to focus on the western part of the CCL. As of now, the blue colored area is the breeding range and the red area is the wintering range. And we have the red crowned crane which is referred to usually as the crane, and we have the white naped crane, which is the black colored crane. And in North Korea, uh, they call it the white crane instead of red crowned crane. I think we need to come up with common uh, terminologies uh, for these uh, animals. In Mongol, red-crowned and white-naped cranes breed, and from October to March, they fly down to CCL. Why do they migrate southward? Does anybody know the reason? Why don't they live up there and travel downward? I heard from a resident, not a scholar. There's a lot of snow, and the cranes cannot have food. And so they come south in search of food. And they come down to CCL, and they also fly to Japan. And looking at Paju and Yeoncheon, these are the pictures that I have taken. These are the paddy fields, and they are spread out very wide. Traditionally, we have these paddies intact, but these provide a lot of benefits to the people. The farmers in Paju have created a rice uh, co-op, and they are engaged in organic farming. I met an old farmer, and I asked him, why do you engage in organic farming? Why don't you just use chemicals? And what he said was, if you engage in organic farming, then the products sell better, and they're also good for the soil, and it's much more sustainable. And the organic rice is much more expensive than the conventional rice. But is this beneficial only to the people? No, we have the creek, the tree frog, and white naped crane and spoonbills. They are animals near extinction and they live in the paddies of Paju. And the area is Chopyeong Island. No man has entered the island in 70 years. And if 
two Koreas unify, there could be a special demand for development. In Paju, Yeonchan, these paddies have been, uh, oh, they are the owners of these paddies are sole citizens. What you're looking at is Yeonchan. We uh, drink, we used to drink Adle. And Adlai grows in Yeonchan, and what you see on in the next picture is the cranes. They uh, eat uh, Adlai for food. Globally, the, the crane scholars, when they come to Korea, they're surprised by uh, the cranes eating Adlai. It's a rare sight that uh, the cranes eat Adlai. So we need to protect, but we don't think about protecting these territories. We just think about how to develop them. These fields of Adlai actually help support the livelihood of the farmers extensively. Uh, there are 256 farming families that are farming these Adlai, uh, and a lot of Adlai is being produced, but uh, the quantity is actually declining over the years. In Yeoncheon, uh, these cranes are feeding off of the Adlai. And the, this area actually is populated by a lot of species that are uh, at the risk of extinction. Uh, this is Cholwon. Somebody said that after uh, the two Koreas were divided, uh, Kim Il-sung, if uh, Kim Il-sung actually said that uh, it would be great to have rice uh, grown in Cholwon and have them shipped to North Korea. And uh, that's the extent to which farming is very actively done in Cholwon. This is possible because of this streams of water. And actually, these streams of water are not frozen even during winter times. So this is a great place for wintering species to uh, you know, spend their winter. This is why a lot of wintering species, including the red crown cranes, fly to Cholwon. Now, the farmers of Cholwon are working to improve the situation there by engaging in organic farming involving uh, the leveraging of red crown cranes that winter there. So there is this rice wine uh, that has been branded by the farmers of uh, the Cholwon area using their produce. Oh, excuse me. And this is not just beneficial for the rice paddies are not just beneficial for the farmers. You can see these ri uh, red crown cranes. So the rice paddies that you see now have already been harvested, and this is winter time. And you can see, you know, uh, a lot of cranes sitting there. Why are they there? The farmers actually leave 3% of the grains on the ground uh, for the cranes to feed off of during the wintering season. So in Cholwon area, as many as seven d different species of the red crown crane can be found in, uh, in the Cholwon area. So now, if you look here, there is this uh, very narrow canal that's formed alongside of the farm. Uh, this is the water that flows comes from the you know hills nearby, and very cold water flows into the field. Uh, and they want to have uh, this water, you know, gain higher temperature before they flow into the paddy so that the, uh, the seeds of rice do not die off because of the cold. Now, can you see the differences between the pictures on the top? This field is right after the harvest. 
and uh, the stacks of straws are there left for the so on the right, we have uh, the field that is just there, uh, leaving the straws for the animals to feed off of. And on the left side, you have stacks of organized straws. And uh, you see here how the paddies are filled with water by the farmers in order to help the cranes to rest and relax during winter time. Why do cranes prefer to rest in areas with a lot of water? Why do you think they do so? Because, because the sound of water can help them uh, protect themselves from natural enemies because they can you know, hear the steps of, you know, nat other species that may attack them as they walk into the water. So this is why the cranes uh, try to relax where there's a lot of water. And then they, after wintering, they leave uh, the Taiwan area in March. Now, on the right, hand side at the bottom, there is a picture of a natural canal that has been formed and this helps the cranes to rest and survive the winter. In Yeoncheon, starting from April last year, the National Farmers Association and the farmers in the Yeoncheon County worked together to create rice paddies and the rice produced from these new set of paddies uh, originally uh, were planned for delivery to North Koreans to support them but the North Korean government said it's okay and uh, they will not uh, receive uh, this rice so now it's being used to support the the people who are under economic stress. I do not know why the remainder of the presentation has disappeared. Actually, I have more slides. I actually had more slides. So we talk about conserving the DMZ, and to do so, we need to protect and preserve the uh, CCL, and we have to protect and preserve the rice fields. That is very essential to any sort of preservation effort in uh, the DMZ. We believe that uh, this can provide a very good opportunity for exchange between North and South Koreas. Uh, the cranes, you know, they have cranes in Japan. So there are wintering ranges for cranes in Japan and also uh, along the CCL. Uh, but actually, you know, the cranes that come to the Choiwan area are true migratory birds, whereas in Japan, they have sort of settled, make th made themselves settled uh, in Japan. So in that sense, the cranes that have migrated during winter times to Choiwan are very special in that regard. And also in Germany, after unification, they have created a special protected area along the borderline. And they actually are interested in understanding what the South Korean government's plan was to preserve the DMZ area. Uh, because the South Korean government initially uh, set aside a very slim zone of protection, but we have been working hard to push the government to expand that protected zone along the DMZ because 
previously, the government was more focused on development of the land. Uh, right now, we are unable to engage in active talks with our North Korean counterparts, so at least we would like to continue the discussion with the South Korean government. So we want to have a clearer vision set forth by the Korean government to preserve the area alongside the CCL and the broader DMZ. And we need to have a special act to make this possible. The National Ecological Institute uh, conducted a research on the ownership of the land in this area, and uh, it appears there are some uh, very tricky issues that need to be dealt with. But anyway, the government should really take the initiative to preserve this area. I mean, there are a lot of state-owned land, so at least we could set those state-owned land as protection zones. Uh, and of course, there are privately owned land. As for those privately owned lands, uh, I think the government should get involved and try to designate these areas as, you know, areas for preservation of these different species and the environment. And we want to co-work with the government in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kim talked about why the rice paddies alongside the CCL need to be protected. And um, she talked about what uh, recommendations Korean Federation of Environmental Movements have for the Korean government. So I think during the panel discussion, uh, we could maybe come up with more ideas. Now, this concludes the presentations that we have for this session. We're going to start the panel discussion. We have two panelists. So from Youth Climate Energy Action, we have Ms. Kang Eun-bin, who is the co-executive director. So please, Ms. Kang, you can make comments or ask questions to the three presenters. Hello, everyone. I am with Youth Climate Ener Emergency Action. I am Kang Eun-bin. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for the presentations. I did read in advance, and I was able to listen to the presentations on the floor. Before I was a climate activist, I had focused on the I wanted to focus on the national division, and I attended the Department of Political Science, but I became interested in the climate issues, and so that's why I am taking this action. And so these were the personal uh, challenges that I had, and it's an honor for me to be able to share my thoughts with you during the forum. I do agree with what Mr. Huang said. Oftentimes, we do look at North Korea as purely a uh, rich reserve of natural resources or as a place that needs to be developed uh, with uh, ideas and initiatives from South Korea. And I really agreed with your criticism. Uh, within our organization, we have certain projects where we actually have filed suit. Uh, and we began with our movement to address the issue of, you know, coal, extensive coal use and uh, the lack of climate response. And we felt, you know, exporting coal to other countries is, is not a just thing to do. Uh, so we should not be exporting coal to emerging economies or, uh, or exporting coal power plant technology to uh, other countries, although the Korean people often think that while we should go low carbon in Korea, it's economically beneficial for Korea to export coal power plant technology to other countries. Uh, and actually, 86% of uh, the respondents actually agreed that this kind of exporting of coal power plant technology is very important. 
Uh, but then we are continuously seeing a decline in the number of people who are supporting this kind of idea just based on the national interest. Uh, we need to continue to be able to see environmental issues uh, as a priority, uh, perhaps over uh, serving national interest. So in terms of institutions, you talked about, uh, you know, managing the, you know, resources in North Korea as commons. And I also think the idea of commons as a great strategy. So can you be more specific about managing this as commons? And Ms. Kim, you proposed a number of things toward the end of your presentation. Based on my understanding of the concept of commons, it's not really state-owned and it's not owned by the market. But there are constituents in the society participate in the development and the use of and the preservation of the commons. So I think that is the essence of the commons movement. So in that regard, Ms. Kim Chun Yi, your focus was more on the state-driven approach to preserving the environment. But the Minister of Environment and the current Korean administration continue to carry out projects or condone projects that have environmental impact. So given the situation, do you think it is possible to have state-driven efforts to preserve the natural environment? Do you think by having new legislations and state-driven efforts, uh, do you think these efforts are enough or sufficient to preserve the natural environment? Uh, don't you think that perhaps we can come up with more imaginative and alternative ways of preserving our natural environments? So do you have any ideas that can be alternative to your suggestion of a more state-driven protection of the environment? And uh, you also talked about how people uh, who have ownership of the land in Paju who are waiting for the development of that land for great economic gains. So uh, can you also touch upon that a little bit more? And uh, I have a question for Mr. Nam Sang-min, the first speaker. Uh, the inter-Korean uh, cooperation may be sensitive to political changes and some people may be frustrated, why isn't this working? Four years now, it seems like it was a past dream and no progress has been made. But the UN is an international organization which is neutral and could be independent uh, from these uh, changes in the atmosphere. So. Both Koreas are members to the Paris Convention. And do you think establishing the channels could promote cooperation, maybe not relying on the leadership, but having uh, closer ties at the grassroots level? Uh, maybe the UN could provide a channel between the youths between the two Koreas, and is that a possible solution? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Executive Director Kang has given questions to each speaker. We will listen to the responses first and then invite more questions from Chairperson Yun Ho of the Green Party. Mr. Nam, would you like to answer the question? Please go ahead. Uh, Executive Director Kang, thank you for the question. And I also have a comment to make on Mr. Huang's presentation. 
Going back to the question in 2018, we have uh, some memories that, that vanished. In relation to North Korea, there are two things to consider from the UN perspective. There are the UN sanctions because the UN uh, places sanctions uh, on and enforces the sanctions on North Korea and at the same time, it provides humanitarian aid. I did have a special experience and many of you, uh, I'm sure you read the VNR report. In, I was uh, part of uh, the process of writing that report. I invited the working level people from North Korea three times, and there was experience sharing sessions and training sessions, and North Korea provided us with the first draft, and I was there for reviewing the statistics. And inside the report are four very complicated looking graphs, and we helped North Korea with with that. So, as a Korean and as a member of the UN, I was able to directly participate in the process of North Korea writing up the VNR report. And uh, it was the Ministry of Interior, the Statistics Office, the North Korean Academy of Science, and I was able to feel how serious they were about sustainable development. And uh, climate change appears 24 times and disaster appears 74 times in the report. So I could feel that the problem was dire. And as for the Academy of Science in North Korea, I was uh, feeling their uh, concern coming from the scientists. And they are uh, talking about follow-up projects, but because of COVID-19, there is no exchange of people, so there, it has been put on hold. But environmental uh, destruction, uh, disaster statistics, there have been trainings provided uh, that were planned for North Korea, but that has been put on hold. And uh, greenhouse gas inventory, renewables, there was demand for training in these areas from North Korea. So when the inter-Korean relations improve, I think that could be a very productive agenda. And it does not have to be bilateral. It could be in a multilateral setting and uh, have the stakeholders meet and share their experiences. And Mr. Huang has mentioned some elements, and I would like to add to that. Looking at the European experience, there are 35 countries, and by 2030, they are targeting 40% of renewables in their energy mix, and they are strengthening their systems. And looking at the European experience, uh, they have the distributed energy, and it's not in conflict with centralized energy systems. System, and I cannot go into details. And the second part is I am a part of uh, the Green Movement and uh, the youth activists. I couldn't agree with you more. And we need to reduce the energy demand and increase energy efficiency. That is a must. But electricity usage is bound to increase because uh, energy for transportation, for home use and industrial, most of the energy is in the form of electricity. We have 129 gigawatt and and it can only increase. So how can we uh, convert that to renewables? So we are, should benchmark the European 
cases. And looking at the North Korean energy system, I, there's a lot of talk about the SDGs. But what I am frustrated about is North Korea is already seeking their way out. But it seems that South Korea is you know, intervening in what North Korea is trying to do. They are already on their way. Many options could be shown to North Korea because they may not be aware of all of them. And 36.4% of electricity access, that is such a low number. And I was so surprised. And World Bank said 45%. And is this correct? Maybe they have some issues with their statistics methodology. And in China, they're uh, importing a lot of solar panels from China and have been installed in individual households, and that may not have been reflected in the statistics. So how to overcome these technologies? technical aspects. So not only Europe, but in Africa and Asia, we need to have the countries interconnected, but it seems that Korea is left out, North Korea is left out. The, the different systems may be a challenge, but if uh, we could have interconnection, then we could build a stronger trust. The system had been severed between the two Koreas, but maybe we could tie them back together to gain more trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nam. So perhaps Dr. Huang, can you respond to the questions? Uh, first, I would like to respond to the questions posed by uh, Ms. Kang and also uh, respond to Mr. Nam's comments. Uh, first of all, I agree with what was pointed out. And the you know preoccupation with national interest has driven our effort to export nuclear power plant technology and also the coal-fired power plant technology. Uh, and I think we need to redefine what really constitutes national interest. We have been sort of a developmental state, and I think that philosophy still remains with us in some sense. So sometimes we try to, you know, migrate and export industries that we cannot really ethically pursue on the Korean Peninsula and have that uh, prosper in other countries. But I think we really need to rethink think what constitutes natural or national interest and with regards to the DMZ uh, the presentation about uh, Ms. Kim Chun Yi uh, and uh, Ms. Kang asked about the commons concept well we need to think about whether North Korea can really take the initiative in leading their energy transition and I think uh, there is an effort to look at the globe as an entirety. We often focus on the humanity. And I think there is a question that we need to ask about whether human beings are the only true agents uh, on this globe. Uh, we should think about cranes and other species. Cranes should not be seen just as a, an opportunity for marketing the area or branding the area. Uh, perhaps uh, these cranes can really contribute uh, to the promotion of peace on the peninsula. And I think that sort of an approach is possible when we look at the commons concept. So beyond going uh, going beyond the concept or the focus on humans, uh, you know, we should really approach uh, these issues from a commons perspective. And uh, Mr. Nam, 
uh, made certain comments. Well, actually, I had to make very simplistic presentation in the interest of time. So perhaps that is why, uh, you know, there were certain issues that uh, Mr. Nam pointed out. Uh, well, in Europe, supergrid initiatives promoted by Europe, you know, Morocco, for example, were excluded in the initiative and the residents of Mor Morocco were kicked out of the area. Of course, this cannot be overgeneralized, but we do need to look into the certain limitations or side effects of, you know, supergrid. Instead of just saying supergrid is the only solution uh, for this energy issue, we should look at uh, certain limitations or consequences. And we need to take into consider, for example, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, different possibilities. And I think uh, you know, we have the technology to encourage decentralized uh, energy system in North Korea. So I think we should look into that uh, because North Korean officials already have certain ideas for their energy transition. And so instead of just passing advice to North Korea, as if we know everything, we really need to be humble and modest when we discuss these uh, issues with North Korean counterparts. I mean, these are very important issues, and I think we need to be wise in our approach. And the VNR report, uh, I know you participated in that, so you probably know this very well, but um, North Korea, when producing the VNR eff uh, effort, uh, VNR report, I think uh, uh, this created a very good momentum for North Korea to really take the initiative in dealing with the energy transition issues. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the deep and uh, profound questions from Mr. Huang. I read a paper and the, uh, we should avoid the tragedy of commons, so make it uh, state-owned. But managing the commons has other options than privatization or state-owned. The citizens could manage and protect the commons, and there was a paper, and it was welcomed by the world over. So in the beginning of 2000s, the U.S. groups came and they were worried about uh, future development of the land near CCL. And people were interested in purchasing the land for the gains to be come from uh, development, but we were concerned about the well-being of the farmers. How can we steal the property away from the farmers? We were just concerned and we couldn't just act out, and who were these lands sold to? To the rich people living in Seoul. As you mentioned before, if the land, even if the land is not state-owned, the owners of the land, maybe they could uh, sign up a pact together and not sell the land. That would enable the commons management, but they already sold their land. The farmers are uh, farming their lands, but they are not owners of the land. And how can we preserve the cranes? It needs to become a reserve, and this needs to be managed by the Ministry of Environment, maybe the Ministry of uh, Interior, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of other areas. They are not interested because they are not interested in the protection and preservation of the ecosystem. In order to protect these creatures, then we need the help of the Ministry of Unification, then we could uh, support the farmers engaged in crane farming. 
So we need to designate these areas as reserves. That is a priority. That's what we are talking about. And plus, in Paju and Yanchan, buying property in these regions, uh, some groups are purchasing the land, but they're financially strapped, so they're buying really small plots of land. And when there are rumors of the land being purchased and the owner of the land raises the price again. So we are moving in very small uh, parcels and plots of land. Maybe large corporates could purchase the land altogether and then uh, sell it back to the government. This could be an idea. Thank you. As I listen to the responses, it raises more questions that we need to cover. Uh, but since we have a second panelist, I would like to give the opportunity to Mr. Unhu Lee of the Green Party Korea's Climate Justice Committee to deliver his comments and questions. And then we will continue with the discussion. And uh, depending on the time, we could perhaps cover uh, some of the other points that rose up. Now I would like to begin my comments. As was introduced, I am the co-chairperson of the Climate Justice Committee of the Green Party Korea. My name is Lee Eun-ho. I think this was a great session and a very good discussion is taking place. I learned a lot and I actually have some of my questions answered already. And I think the Peace Forum has taken a great step in, talk, talk, in talking about the climate change and energy transition on the Korean Penilla, Peninsula. So based on what I heard from the presenters, I would like to raise some questions and maybe share some comments so that we can continue with the discussion. First of all, inter-Korean cooperation uh, and inter-Korean issues often revolve around security issues. But uh, we are now thinking about even ecological security, although this concept is not as familiar to everyone. Especially in the age of the climate crisis, we really need to overcome our past traumatic experience of a civil war and try to work together between the two Koreas to preserve the ecosystem on the peninsula and respond effectively to the climate change crisis. So I think that is the approach that we're taking at the Green Party. So from this ecological security perspective, we need to pursue energy transition, both in South and in the North. So it's not a simplistic energy transition that I'm talking about. As was mentioned by the presenters before, carbon, coal, and gas, fossil fuels, uh, we've been extracting these resources and we've been depleting these resources. And by doing so, we've been supporting the carbon civilization. But in order to respond effectively to the climate crisis, we need to really change everything about our lifestyle, including our daily preferences. So my first question, is this. Uh, actually, maybe, um, I don't know how to put this, but maybe uh, objective management or target management. So when the two Koreas uh, do achieve unification, how can we manage our climate control goals effectively? Uh, and actually, uh, North Korea uh, proposed plans to build more coal-fired power plants, and uh, South Korean side has proposed the peace power plant. Uh, in my case, I actually, uh, you know, participated in a hunger strike for 14 days uh, in lieu of P4G. And there are... 10 major power plants 
uh, actually at least uh, uh, a lot of the power plants um, that are being constructed are almost completed in South Korea. But if we are to unify, we may actually need to work together with our counterparts in North to set better targets to budget our carbon use better. So how can we effectively do this is one concern. And also, the model is another issue. I mean, there was the decentralized energy transition model that uh, was talked about. And uh, Kim chun Yi talked about the grassroots approach. Well, although it's difficult to say a completely state-owned, uh, you know, approach, we do have the uh, company Kepco, and it is suffering a significant uh, deficit. It's a centrally run corporation, and they provide compensation for the power plants and also the power producers, allowing the consumers of electricity to use power in a relatively affordable way. So, in this context, how can we achieve better decentralization going forward? I mean, there are energy centers being built by the different local governments, and the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy provides some subsidies, but it's not enough. So we really need to uh, think about better ways of decentralizing the energy system, and perhaps some uh, people on in this session could share some ideas. And my second question is about uh, the issue of language and also uh, the way we see North Korea. In South Korea, as a democratic state, there are a lot of conflicting views and uh, different opinions about the renewable energy. So what sort of language can we use to address these issues? So some of the local residents are not really used to the idea of using renewable energies. And in the cities, uh, they often see these transmission lines that they feel hurt their environment. So if we are to you know, promote something similar in North Korea, what sort of language can we use to you know, present these ideas? And also, as Ms. Kang suggested, how can we effectively interact with the youth in North Korea? Uh, President Moon at COP21 suggested that a global youth summit should be launched. And if such a summit is organized, uh, will we be able to interact with young environmentalists from North Korea? Could we communicate effectively? using what sort of language to discuss these issues. These are some things that I think about a lot. Now, my final question is about just transition and balanced regional uh, development. When I say balanced regional development, uh, oftentimes people when they talk about regional balanced development, they think about building new airports or building a new power plant. But I don't want that sort of balanced regional development to take place in North Korea. So if we want to transition our energy mix towards renewables, what sort of profit sharing or benefit sharing can we have? So we need to work towards more just transition. And the benefits of the transition needs to be distributed in a more equitable way. So uh, these are the three questions that I have for our presenters. Thank you very much. There were three large questions, and each 
presenter doesn't need to cover all three questions, but I think you can just address the questions that you feel are most relevant to your interests and concerns. So, Ms. Kim chun perhaps you can take the first question. Well, you talked about goal management concerning climate response. So how can we better manage the climate response goals? And second was about interaction with the young advocates or environmentalists in North Korea. And thirdly, the question was about profit or benefit sharing and achieving a just transition. With regards to profit sharing, I think the German people, you know, uh, agree with the issue of climate change, and yet they also have a lot of negative reactions towards uh, facilities that enter their community because they might hurt the landscape and, uh, you know, cause uh, a number of issues. So there are certain ways in which conflict is managed and addressed through dialogue. Now, in Korea, I think we need to, uh, you know, increase the opportunities for hearing the voices of the local residents, because the local residents have uh, previously unheard voices, and we need to open up the space for the local residents to share their concerns and share their requirements and demands. And I think we need to create that space of dialogue, and that can actually help win the hearts of the local residents uh, towards uh, better renewables uh, energy use. When coal-fired power plants and nuclear power plants were first uh, being developed in certain regions in Korea, uh, there was little resistance from the local residents because at the time, you know, there was general uh, support of the government by the local residents thinking that you know, citizens should not really oppose the government initiatives, but now the thinking has really changed and local residents are more vocal. Uh, especially when it comes to labor issues. I heard that uh, in Germany, when there were large contracts with a German company, uh, certain products uh, need, can be paid for up to a certain year, but after that, if it's against the carbon neutrality goals, they will not be able to, you know, do transactions uh, about that product with the company. So there are these uh, things that are happening at the labor sec in the labor sector. And, uh, you know, North Koreans are not very different when it comes to the real issues that they face uh, in their everyday lives. So I think uh, interaction with the young people in North Korea uh, is not infeasible. Maybe at the UN level, if a UN youth summit is organized, this could be a great opportunity for engaging with the North Korean youth. There have been opportunities for engagement between uh, religious leaders with farmers, but we have never really had an engagement with the North Korean youth leaders, so perhaps uh, we need to work towards that. I would like to comment about the question of interaction with the youth. I mean, formerly, the university activists in South Korea had gone over to North Korea to engage with the students there. I mean, they, these things did happen in the past. Uh, but there are issues like the K-drama and their influence on the North Korean uh, viewers and the Labor Party in North Korea have less trust and and there is uh, instability internally in North Korea trying to gain support 
uh, and secure uh, support for the government amongst the young generation in North Korea. So, given the situation, uh, well, it is important for us to really interact with the young people in North Korea, but realistically speaking, it's very difficult to you know, meet face to face uh, with the young people in North Korea. I hope that uh, that day comes soon when we are able to talk with the young North Korean leaders. Mr. Nam, uh, yes. I did write down the three questions, but I think they're uh, difficult questions. I have not given much thought to those issues. As to uh, the global climate change, ammonia, <coughs> hydrogen fuels, CCS, carbon capture and storage are topics of interest. But uh, the meeting with the officials in charge has not been possible. And there's no telling when I'll be able to meet the officials in charge. But what I'd like to propose to is Kang Eun-bin is we now started recently uh, the carbon neutrality pact in Northeast Asia. There has been no initiative taken multilaterally because of sensitive issues. So there was no uh, initiative, but now all the three countries have come up with the carbon neutrality targets. So it was the first time that the government representatives got together last year. And in that sense, the youth could have a similar initiative. We have very active uh, youth environmentalists in China. And uh, maybe we could have the network amongst the youth in Northeast Asia, and that could be a potential idea. And uh, SDG Forum is held every year in Northeast Asia, and North Korea participates. Because of COVID-19, it was uh, an online forum, but in Vladivostok two years ago, 40 people came from South Korea, Five people came from North Korea and there were discussions that took place. Maybe the youth groups could use that Northeast Asia SDG Forum. Uh, they were not youth from North Korea, they, they were officials from North Korea. Maybe you could uh, exchange ideas with them. Thank you. We dealt with a wide range of issues, but we were only given 90 minutes to this session. There could have been questions from the floor, but in the interest of time, we cannot entertain them. With this, I'd like to close the forum. Today, we've listened to the presentations and the panel discussion, and maybe you gain some ideas about how to protect the ecosystem and how to go about cooperating in energy transition. I think uh, it was a session that gave us food for thought, and in that sense, we had the chance to raise fundamental issues. In energy transition, we had uh, limited ourselves to just South Korea, but we need to think about energy transition in a bigger picture, and what kind of collaboration will we need? I think we have to think about these issues further. I would like to thank the speakers and the panelists for your precious time, and I would like to also thank the attendees. With this, I'd like to end this session. Thank you.